Stop and Listen presents Bombing Mission, an unofficial Final Fantasy VII story. Written by Lawrence Mueller. Narrated by Trent Martin. He stood on the roof of the running train, and the cold Midgar air brushed past his face. The team was lucky to have him on this mission, Cloud Strife thought to himself. He was ex-soldier, after all. First class, mind you. Once a member of the organization, he was now recruited to fight against. His current employer was Avalanche, a terrorist organization. Of course, they wouldn't label themselves as terrorists. Instead, they claim to fight for the planet, whatever that meant. Avalanche's leader, Barrett Wallace, had tried to lecture Cloud about the planet on more than one occasion. The planet's dying, Cloud! He had said, waving his gun arm in the air. That damn Shinra's sucking this planet dry! Polluting it, too! Cloud didn't know if that was true, and he certainly didn't care. All Cloud wanted was to get this job done and get paid. In fact, he would have preferred not to take this job at all if it wasn't for his childhood friend, Tifa Lockhart. Barrett had offered Cloud a generous payment for his services, but Cloud only accepted when Tifa had guilted him into taking it. Tifa ran a bar called Seventh Heaven back in Sector 7. She was the one that had introduced him to Barrett because Avalanche's hideout was stationed there. Although it didn't seem like much of a hideout or headquarters at all, it looked like any crappy old bar the last time Cloud had been there. He had mentioned something to Barrett back then. Maybe I'll show you later, Barrett had said to Cloud. But I don't trust you. He had gotten up in Cloud's face about it, trying to be imposing. That probably worked for him, usually, as Barrett seemed like a giant compared to, well, anyone. Whatever, Cloud had thought to himself. It was probably a good thing. The less he knew about Avalanche, the better. He didn't feel like getting too mixed up in any of this. The old train started to rumble and shake under his feet as it slowed down before it came to a screeching halt at the station of Sector 1. As Cloud had anticipated, there were several Shinra troops patrolling the platform. The guards would have to be taken out quickly, so they can't raise the alarm. That would ruin the plan before they would even make it to the reactor. Time to look sharp. Cloud drew his sword, ready to jump off and strike. But the man, who Cloud recognized as one of Avalanche's crew members, had already jumped off the train. It was a slim young man with short, dark hair and a red bandana wrapped around his head. He wore olive and green colored clothes and brown leather boots. One of those boots had now found its way into the face of one of the guards. The kick had knocked the guard out cold because he didn't get up. Not bad, Cloud thought to himself. One of the other guards near him was visibly stunned for a moment by what just happened but then quickly composed himself. He drew his Shinra standard issue baton and charged at his attacker. Unfortunately for the guard, his momentum was used against him. He was swiftly thrown to the ground, also staying down for the count. But now, his luck seemed to have run out. The avalanche fighter couldn't possibly react fast enough to dodge the gunfire about to come his way. The final guard, still standing, had raised his rifle and aimed it at his back. The guard had a clear shot and was ready to fire. There's no way Cloud would make it in time to save him. Perhaps he had overestimated his teammate's ability. Suddenly, a young woman jumped the guard from behind. She had exited the train through one of the windows, right where the guard was standing. Her reddish-brown ponytail gracefully waved in the air behind her as she roundhouse kicked the guard so hard he flew back several feet. He landed with an audible thud against the metal train. 
she looked up and smiled at Cloud, who was still observing from the train roof. She adjusted the armor she wore and fixed the red band around her head, before signaling the coast was clear. Not bad at all. He had assumed Avalanche to be a ragtag group of inexperienced amateurs. But now, he thought that maybe they weren't so inadequate after all. Of course, he would never admit that, especially to Barrett, who now also found his way onto the platform, along with the final member of their crew. The last guy was pudgier than the first. He also wore a red bandana, but his was covering his whole head, with only a few locks of his black hair coming out from underneath. Wearing a yellow shirt and bright blue pants, he looked like he didn't quite belong. Barrett now stood on the platform, intensely scoping out his surroundings. He looked like some military man, gone mad. Green army pants and a worn leather jacket. Dog tags were hanging from his neck, and tattoos covered his shoulder. A giant, rotating gun was attached to one of his arms, where his right hand used to be. Come on! Barrett shouted at Cloud. Let's go, newcomer! All right. Showtime. Cloud put his free hand on the edge of the train and threw his body up over his arm, landing perfectly on his feet on the platform. He stood up straight and raised up his sword, placing it on its magnetic holder on his back. You're such a damn show-off, Barrett accused Cloud. This is a serious mission, and that sword is... Oh, it's just ridiculous. Ridiculous? Well, sure. His sword was on the larger side, being almost as tall and wide as Cloud himself, but no one could deny he was extremely effective with it. Cloud could swing his oversized sword effortlessly, cutting through the air with fast and precise strokes. His buster sword was a memento from his soldier days. Yet, when he thought about it, he didn't quite remember exactly when he acquired his buster sword. That was odd. Cloud quickly averted his thoughts as it made him feel uneasy trying to remember. That's coming from a man with a gun mounted on his arm. Cloud simply replied, What? You? Oh, forget it. We are wasting time. Let's move out. The five of them left the platform and made their way into the Shinra power plant for Reactor 1. They were met with little resistance along the way. The Shinra troops they did run into, a few guards armed with rifles and guard hounds, were easily dispatched by Cloud. He took them out so efficiently they hardly had any time to react. The team arrived at the control station. They gathered in front of the elevator that would lead them down to the reactor. The guy who had spearheaded the attack at the station earlier walked up to Cloud. Wow, man. You were amazing back there, he admiringly said. Yeah, you sure are soldier, all right. Not something you get to see every day. He's soldier? The girl with the ponytail asked, who was busy working on bypassing the elevator controls. Aren't they supposed to be... the enemy? He wasn't soldier, Jesse. He quit them, and now he's with us. The girl, apparently called Jessie, glanced up at Cloud. He noticed a reddish glow on her cheeks before she turned back to her work. I'm Biggs, said the guy standing in front of Cloud, and this is Wedge. He gestured to the chubby guy behind him, who was inspecting the explosives he carried. Welcome to the team, Cloud, Wedge said joyfully, smiling at him and giving a thumbs up. Didn't catch your name, Biggs said as he extended his hand out to Cloud. I don't care what your names are, Cloud answered, ignoring Biggs' attempt at a handshake. Once this job's done, I'm out of here. No socializing. That was his rule. A job is a job. Nothing more. He distanced himself from people. He carried within himself a deep, dark foreboding of getting attached. To anyone. Where these feelings came from was not clear. Even to Cloud. His name's Cloud, a voice said from behind him. Barrett had just come back from checking out the rest of the control station and walked up to Jesse at the elevator. How we doing? He asked Jesse. Just this last wire and got it. 
The elevator opened its doors, and Barrett stepped in front of it. He turned around and addressed his crew. All right, the first part's over. Don't go messing up now. He gestured at Biggs and Wedge. You guys wait here. Keep watch and our escape route clear. Right, Biggs acknowledged. You are coming with me, Barrett said to Cloud. I'll keep my eye on you. What does a guy have to do to prove himself? After all, he had taken out his share of Shinra soldiers on the way over here, hadn't he? But then again, he didn't care about Barrett's distrust. Still, it bugged Cloud that he was still associated with Shinra this way. Fine. He simply replied, Do what you want. Jesse, you come too, Barrett continued. We need you to stand by and be ready with the elevator when we come back. We don't have long before that bomb goes off. We gotta be well clear of this place when it does. Right, Jesse replied. The three of them, Barrett, Jesse, and Cloud, stepped into the elevator. It was rather cramped, with Barrett taking up half the space inside. Jesse pressed the button for the lowest floor. This would bring them all the way down to the pumping installation of the reactor. The mission. Plant an explosive at the main pump, disabling the reactor's ability to extract Mako from the planet. Of course, this would make but a minor dent in Shinra's operation. They had eight such reactors around the edge of the city of Midgar alone, not counting the others spread across the planet. Shinra Corporation, named after its founder, President Shinra, had once started out as a small electric company. But when they discovered Mako and how to harness its energy, they quickly and exponentially grew to a large organization. Shinra soon became the world's sole governing entity. Converting Ra Mako into energy allowed them to power, well, anything. They provided the public with the energy for their needs, and they made sure there was plenty of need for their energy. In order to protect their interests and safeguard their position of power, Shinra created several military branches. The bulk of the military consisted of basic Shinra troops, common foot soldiers. Many boys from towns all over the world enlisted, including Cloud. They dreamed of one day being accepted into the elite branch that was Soldier, dreaming of glory and thrill, but most never made the cut. Now they were nothing more than glorified guards and peacekeepers. Then there was a secretive investigative department called the Turks. Oh, how Cloud despised the Turks. They mainly existed to carry out the dirty work, with things like espionage, kidnappings, and even assassinations being among their daily activities. Of course, the general public didn't know any of this. Even the mere existence of the Turks was not common knowledge. On occasion, people would tell stories of seeing shady people wearing black suits and dark sunglasses. The last branch was Soldier. These were the elite. Only the best of the best made it this far. And even then, Soldier was divided in ranks. Third class up to first class. First class members were often seen as invincible fighting machines and heroic figures. Soldier's purpose was to carry out critical missions that required extraordinary ability. Its operatives are genetically altered they have supernatural speed, strength, and agility. This was achieved by infusing them with certain levels of Mako, among other experiments the Shinra Research Department performed behind curtains. You could often tell if someone was from Soldier. Their eyes would have a slight glow and take on the color of Mako, a bluish-green color. Like so many others, it was Cloud's childhood dream of joining Soldier and becoming a hero like the legendary first-class soldier, Sephiroth. One thing is for sure, Cloud does not look up to Sephiroth anymore. Nor would he consider him any kind of hero. Not since that day. The elevator stopped, pulling Cloud back into the present moment. The door slid open, and Jesse stepped out, followed by Barrett and Cloud. Jesse folded out what looked like a blueprint of the reactor. How did she manage to obtain that? Cloud wondered. 
She took the lead as they went further down. They made their way across narrow platforms and climbed down several not particularly safe-looking ladders attached to giant pipes. Make one slip and you'll end up in the giant, bubbling, whirling pool of raw mako below. Cloud didn't want to imagine what falling into that would do to a person. After a few minutes of carefully walking and climbing, Jesse stopped and turned to Barrett and Cloud. Okay, climb down this ladder and follow those large pipes, she said as she checked her blueprint. That should take you straight to the main pumping installation. And blow it all to hell, Barrett added. Right, Jesse replied, but please be careful. You too, Cloud. Me? Cloud answered, surprised. Of course, you're one of us now, Jesse continued, and we always look out for each other. Um, all right. Thanks, Cloud replied. If you two lovebirds are done, we should get a move on, Barrett said. What? Jesse objected. No, I wasn't... I'll lead the way from here, Cloud said, stepping on the ladder. Right behind you. Barrett replied. I really wasn't. Cloud and Barrett saw the main pump in front of them. They made their way across a long, narrow platform. It was suspended over the reservoir of Mako below, green fumes rising from it. All around them were pipes, spewing clouds of Mako gas. The pool of Mako itself was now so close you could almost touch it. Not that you would want to. Just being this close made Cloud feel lightheaded. When we blow this place, this ain't gonna be nothing more than a hunk of junk, Barrett said. Cloud, you set the bomb. He handed Cloud the explosives. Shouldn't you do it? Cloud replied. After all, this was Barrett's mission. He was the one wanting to blow this place to hell, and Cloud merely helped him get here. The honor should be his, right? Just do it, Barrett commanded. I gotta watch to make sure you don't pull nothing. Watch him, Cloud thought. Was this some sort of test? To see if he'd betray them? Could it be that Barrett was planning to permanently recruit Cloud to join his crew? To join Avalanche? Whatever Barrett's reasons were, it didn't matter right now. Be my guest, Cloud merely replied. Cloud stepped towards the valve. Then, a loud, deafening, high-pitched beeping sound flooded his ears. The sound pierced down to his bones, making him feel as if he was about to throw up. Watch out, he heard a voice say. He heard the voice in his mind. This isn't just a reactor. It sounded like it was coming from far away, yet it was loud at the same time. It flooded Cloud's head, echoing over and over. Watch out. <sighs> was it warning Cloud? Was it a forgotten memory? Why did he hear this now? What's wrong? As soon as he heard Barrett's voice, the echoing voice vanished as abruptly as it appeared. <sighs> huh? Cloud said, confused by what just happened. What's wrong? Barrett repeated. Hurry it up! Cloud had no idea what that was all about. The Mako fumes probably got to him, and he just felt a bit fuzzy. Surely, that must be all that was. <sighs> yeah, he said as he composed himself. Sorry. Cloud checked the timer on the bomb. Ten minutes, it read. That should be enough. He attached it to the valve. Cloud placed one hand on the button to arm the bomb, and in his other hand, he held the timer. He pressed them at the same time, and both the bomb and timer started to beep in unison. At that moment, alarms went off in the reactor. What? Barrett shouted. You double-crossing! It wasn't me, Cloud interrupted. Although Cloud did not expect it to be here, he knew what was coming their way. Robotic guard, heads up! Sounds of metallic clanking echoed through the reactor. Cloud and Barrett stood back to back, trying to determine the direction it came from. The sounds became louder and louder. 
until they suddenly stopped. Up there, Cloud said. A giant, monstrous piece of machinery hung from the wall, right above Cloud and Barrett. Then it hunched back, bending its six legs. With extreme force, it lunged from the wall. Barrett and Cloud jumped out of the way. Debris fell onto the platform. The robotic guard was now face to face with Barrett and Cloud, towering above them. A scorpion type, Cloud determined. The scorpion rotated left and right and appeared to be scanning its surroundings. What's it doing? Barrett asked. It's calculating the most optimal point to attack, Cloud answered. It doesn't move very fast in battle, but it's highly efficient with its strikes. Hell, I ain't waiting for that, Barrett said. He aimed his gun and opened fire. The scorpion swung around its big metal tail in front of its body, shielding itself from the bullets. It jumped sideways and stretched out its tail, its sharp end directed at Barrett. Cloud jumped between Barrett and the incoming strike. A loud clang of metal on metal as Cloud used the surface of his buster sword to block the scorpion's tail. Whoa! Barrett said. That caught me off guard a little bit. Barrett, hit it again with all you've got, but move around to avoid its attacks, Cloud said. While you do that, I'll circle around and hit it from the rear. Fine, Barrett answered. But just because we're doing it your way doesn't mean I'm taking orders from you, he added. Move! Cloud yelled. The tail came back around for a second attempt. Gah! Barrett yelled angrily, opening fire on the scorpion again while starting to run across the platform. Cloud saw the scorpion was turning to follow Barrett's movements. Great, he thought. That's it! Cloud ran around the scorpion's other side, flanking it from behind. Meanwhile, Barrett kept shooting his gun rotating rapidly and bullet casings ejecting everywhere. Almost there, Cloud thought, a little closer. Cloud noticed a set of small green lights on the scorpion's back, just below its tail. He recognized what it was, its core module. One clean strike would be enough to destroy it. If he could do it, it would take out the entire machine, shutting it down. Cloud readied his sword and swung it back. Are you ready yet? Barrett yelled suddenly. This gun is starting to overheat. Hit it already. The scorpion, alarmed, turned around and swept its tail across the floor. It knocked Cloud away, and he flew into the railing of the platform, bending it. Gah! Gah! Damn it, Barrett! Cloud said as he caught his breath, scrambling back to his feet. The scorpion turned back to face Barrett. As it did, it raised its tail high above its head, and it started to shake violently. Barrett aimed his gun at the scorpion. No. Barrett, wait! Cloud tried to warn Barrett, but Barrett ignored Cloud and unleashed another volley of bullets. A bright, blinding light emitted from the scorpion's tail. Find cover! Cloud yelled. This time, Barrett listened and ducked behind a piece of debris. Blue lasers erupted from the tail end. The scorpion focused the beams at the piece of debris Barrett was hiding behind. The lasers cut clean through, slicing off several chunks. Barrett frantically checked his body to see if anything was still attached. Are you still in one piece? Cloud asked. Barrett looked at his gun arm and gave Cloud an annoyed glance. God, you know what I mean, Cloud said. I'm all right. He didn't get me. Now, what do we do? We have to take out that core module on its back. It's the best chance we have of taking it out quickly, Cloud said, and the clock's ticking. I don't feel like being here when that bomb goes off. All right then, Barrett acknowledged. Barrett raised his gun at the scorpion again. We can't try the same tactic again, Cloud said. It'll be expecting it. Leave it to me. Barrett said. Trust me, you just be ready to hit that core! 
Barrett opened fire and bullets started flying again. The scorpion blocked the incoming fire with its tail, as it did before. It slowly started advancing on Barrett while shielding itself from the bullets. But this time, it made sure to keep both Barrett and Cloud in its field of view, not allowing again for a surprise attack. It was doing a good job at it too, as Cloud was having a difficult time trying to flank it. The Scorpion was now almost within striking distance of Barrett. All the bullets being fired caused Barrett's gun to glow bright red. The firing grinded to a halt as it completely overheated. The Scorpion readied its tail and was about to strike Barrett, who now seemed defenseless with his overheated gun. Cloud was too far away this time to do anything about it, but Barrett had told Cloud to trust him, so he did, and he kept moving. All right, you rust bucket! Take this! Barrett yelled. He pulled a lever on his gun. The heat started to disappear from the barrels and started to collect in front of the gun, suspended in midair. The energy formed into a big, fiery ball. It swirled around as it grew. It became so dense and bright, it looked like a miniature sun. Big shot! Barrett yelled as he released the ball from his gun firing off at the scorpion. Chunks of metal melted and flew off the scorpion's armor as the ball of energy hit it. It ripped through one of its front legs and came out the other side. It exited through the reactor wall, leaving a giant hole. Sparks flew from the exposed wires in its leg. It lost its balance and came crashing down to the ground. With its five still functioning legs, the scorpion still made attempts to get up. Cloud knew it was recalibrating and would be operational again soon if he didn't act quickly. Cloud continued running to the back of the scorpion. Even though it was down on the ground, it was still able to lunge its tail at Cloud. In response, Cloud activated the materia slotted in his buster sword. A bolt of lightning erupted from it and struck the tail, knocking it away. He managed to completely circle around the scorpion's back. There it was again, the core module. One clean strike. Cloud wasn't taking any chances this time. He jumped straight into the air, held his sword back over his head, and swung it forward. The sword came crashing down onto the scorpion. The core module ripped apart and the scorpion systems malfunctioned all at once. It completely shut down and became motionless. <sighs> Thanks, Barrett. That was impressive, Cloud said, relieved. <sighs> you were pretty good too, Barrett admitted. Oh, we gotta go. Cloud said, looking at the timer and remembering they had planted an explosive that would blow them to bits if they didn't get a move on. We've got about three minutes left. They climbed back up the pipes and ladders they came from before. As they neared the exit, leading to the elevators, they saw Jesse frantically pulling on her leg. Hey, she said, when she noticed Cloud and Barrett had returned. I, I kind of got my foot stuck in this platform. Cloud looked at his timer again. A little over a minute, he said. Barrett, go on ahead. I'll get her loose. Don't take too long, Barrett said, moving up the stairs. Cloud, you should get yourself out, Jesse said. I messed up. Please don't get yourself hurt because of me. We look out for each other, right? Cloud said. Jesse smiled. Right. Damn it, Barrett mumbled to himself his hand hovering on the up button of the elevator controls. Damn it! Were they coming? There couldn't possibly have been much time left until that bomb goes off. Thirty seconds at best. Gah! Barrett couldn't take it. His logic told him to get the hell out of here before he'd blow up along with the reactor. But he couldn't. Right as he felt his moral dilemma would make his head explode, before the actual bomb did... 
Cloud emerged from the stairway, followed by Jesse. You trying to kill me? Barrett yelled. Go! Cloud shouted as both Jesse and he jumped into the elevator. At the top, they regrouped with Biggs. He was waiting nervously at the exit of the control station. Wedge is securing our way out, Biggs said. This way! He guided them outside and led them across a bridge. Eight seconds, Cloud said. They were halfway across and saw Wedge standing at the bridge's other side. He was standing beside a ruined, charred door. It looked like it was blown open with explosives. This leads to the city! Hurry! Wedge yelled at their direction. They were almost there. Four seconds, Cloud said. Three. They reached the doorway. Two. Cloud and the others stepped across the threshold. One! One. 